Good morning, everyone. It's lots of good chatter. That's what we like to hear. People talking and sharing and just talking about life, and that's really great. It's a sign of a good, healthy church, I think. Uh, welcome to our service today. Uh, whether you are here in person, on live stream, or on CD, in whichever way you are worshipping with us, we're glad you came. Please join us for a cuppa after the service and chat again with, and some more. As we begin, I would like to thank the music team, the tech team, the singers, welcome back Charlotte, and all the volunteers for their dedication and work at Windsor Community Church. We couldn't do it without you. Do we have any notices? Sweet. A young policeman stopped a reverend at night for not having a backlight on his bike. Very sternly, he said to the Rev, Sir, you know and it's, it's an offence to ride a bike without a backlight, don't you? And the Rev said, I don't need a backlight. The Lord is with me. And as quick as a backlight flash, the young policeman says, Oh, well, that's two on a bike as well. That's two offences then. <laughs> he smiles, gives the Rev two tickets, and smugly walks away. <laughs> as we begin our celebration of praise and worship this morning, um, let's give it to, up to the rock stars of riding, Inger and Lars, <laughs> who are back from the big, bad, beautiful bike ride. I believe it's a ride of biblical proportions. I hear 40 days on a bike, to be exact. Anyway, we're glad you're back. You look good, and we look forward to hearing more about your adventures along the road. So let's give it up for them. Well done. <laughs> Our call to worship comes from First Chronicles this morning. First Chronicles 16, verses 31 to 33. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. Tell all the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea and everything in it shout his praise. Let the fields and their crops burst out with joy. Let the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he is coming to judge the earth. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithfulness. Love endures forever. Let's contemplate those words in our hearts as we sing our first two songs. I lift, Lord, I lift your name on high and an oldie but a goodie joyfully. Let's stand or sit, whatever you prefer, and sing.
as we sit and contemplate those words, your majesty gently washes over me and makes my heart begin to sing joyfully. Please be seated. Let's pray together as we come. Father, we thank you for your great love that gives us so much joy. A joy that cannot be spoken of on the mountaintops and even in the valleys. We know that you are with us. We thank you that we can come and be with you this day. We can come and be with you every day and that you lead and guide us in our daily life and walk. We thank you for the words that we will hear in this place, that we may take those words into our hearts and go out and act upon them. Thank you for all that you do in every hour of every day. We love you. Amen. Kids with purpose. Is there kids with purpose? Well, they're coming anyway. <laughs> oh, you're gone. Oh, well, that's okay. <laughs> yep. Right. Teha. What's your name? Teha. What's your name? Juwan. 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 Easy. Can. Can. Serena. Serena. Wow. You're very special people. Did you know that? You're very special people? Yeah. Good. I'm glad you do. Uh, holidays. I hope you're not going to terrorise your parents while you're on holiday. <sighs> it's a good thing we've got kids with purpose that, you know, mums get a bit of a rest and dads get a bit of a rest. And you can go and... No, you won't. Um, <laughs> um, let's pray for you as you're leading, leaving and going with the helpers for kids with purpose today. So, Father, we pray for each one of these children, Lord. You know them by name. And they have told us their names and we pray for them too. Be with them as they go out this morning for Kids With Purpose and all that they learn and all that they do and all that they say. Lead and guide their lives in Jesus' name. Amen. You can, you can, you can go now. Right, celebrations. Have we got anything to celebrate today? Well, we've got to go over here first. That's just a given. Yep, we'll get to Emily in a moment. Oh. For the big, bad, beautiful bike ride. Okay. Where's the other half? On the other side. On the other side. <laughs> Emily, how old, is it your birthday? Today, how old are you? Today, and how old are you? Two. Happy birthday, Emily. You want a chocolate? Oh, chocolate, not a card. <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, see, it's not the right month yet. We're going this way? Somebody's? Pointed out somebody. Where's Lars? Ah, there he is. The happy helper. I'm sure it was, I'm sure it was all happy, wasn't it? No, no one else for any celebrations? Well, let's sing happy birthday to Emily, everyone. Happy birthday to you. To be birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Emily. Happy birthday to you. 
she's gone all shy now. Could we please have the offering prayer? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for all that we have, for all you've provided us. And in response, we give you these gifts today to continue your good work both here at Windsor and throughout the world. Amen. We're going to carry on in sung worship. Um, we're going to sing the song that Cynthia introduced, introduced to us last week, Completely Known. You'll pick it up. It's easy. Well, kind of. <laughs> and then we're going to sing Soon and Very Soon. And when you sing these words, I hope that you're not just singing them for words, that you take these words deep into your heart and know how much you are loved by Jesus and the Holy Spirit and God above and that we are so fortunate that we can worship in this way when we know of so many people in the persecuted church who can't but they can still sing they can still sing to the Lord and you know it's a great it's a great gift to know that you are completely known and that you are completely loved so let's stand and sing completely known, completely loved. This is our first time doing it. Just warning. Completely known, completely 
Oh, and you may be seated. in you and that you love us so much in Jesus name Amen Sona, have you got the missions prayer? Good morning, everyone. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labour in vain who build it. This scripture verse from Psalm 127, verse 1, has come to the attention of Simon and Judy Collins in various ways in the past few months. And the frequency in which it keeps being brought to their attention has made them pause and take note. It has been a gentle reminder to keep on seeking godly wisdom in the different areas of their work. A main area of difficulty is keeping up with Cambodia's rapidly changing legal landscape. Both Hope International School and OMF are working carefully to stay compliant with the frequently changing Cambodian laws. Simon is very busy in his leadership role with the Field Council and leading the Across Ministry section of OMF. This includes working with medical workers, educa educators, academics, and student ministries. They have been organizing a field conference for OMF in June. Plans for this are progressing well with speakers and leaders in place, and people coming from all over the world to run their kids program. OMF are hoping to renew their Memorandum of Understanding with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs so that they can continue to work in Cambodia. This is the hot season in Cambodia and they have to contend with very high temperatures, 40 to 50 degrees, imagine, which saps your energy and reduces your capacity to function. Some good family news is that 10-year-old Beth was baptised on Easter Sunday and for Simon and Judy, a real joy to see her mature in her faith and her relationship with Jesus. I think our photo is a little bit out of date, but Peter's going to update us with a current um, family photo. Let's join together in prayer. Father God, we pray blessings for Simon and Judy, for Micah, Beth, Joel and Ella, May they know your presence always in everything they do. Give them your strength to endure the hardship of the hot season, the capacity to get work done, and opportunity for rest and re re relaxation. We pray for the decision makers as OMF negotiate their memorandum of understanding with officials, that you will grant all parties wisdom and grace and a positive outcome. We pray that your hand will be seen in all that happens at the field conference in June and all other training events for medical staff that are planned, right down to the kids' programme. 
We pray for Simon and Judy for their plans for returning to New Zealand for home assignment next year. Prepare the way for them, Lord. We ask that you bless them and keep them safe. In Jesus' name, amen. I was thinking about our prayers for others last night when I was preparing worship. And prayers come in all kinds of forms. Um, So today our prayer is going to be a spoken prayer and a prayer that is going to be up on the the, um, screen shortly. And it would be really good if we could say this prayer together. Uh, This prayer is for all of us. There are lots of complex needs and lots to be thankful here at Windsor. Uh, And we all need assurance in the good times and the bad times. So here is a prayer that we're going to say together. Um, It's about surrender. It's about offering up our lives. It's about uh, taking all the things that we hold in our hearts and maybe are anxious about. And I pray that maybe it is something that you might want to use yourself at some point. So we're going to say this prayer together. Dear Lord, it is my will to surrender to you everything that I am and everything that I'm striving to be. I open the deepest recesses of my heart and invite your Holy Spirit to dwell inside of me. I offer you my life, heart, mind, body, soul and spirit. I surrender to you my past, present and future. I ask you to take hold over every aspect of my life. I surrender to you all of my hurt, pain, worry, doubt, fear, and anxiety, and I ask you to wash me clean. I release everything into your compassionate care. Please speak to me clearly, Lord. Open my ears to hear your voice. Open my heart to commune with you more deeply. I want to feel your loving embrace. Open the doors that need to be opened and close the doors that need to be closed. Please set my feet upon the straight and narrow road that leads to everlasting life and to you. I know you love me wholeheartedly. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Peter. Yep, that's you. How's your bike? Got a backlight? I I went to um, a doctor's appointment this week and I got re-measured for my height and um, the doctor told me that I'd lost four millimetres in height, part of my old age. (laughs) No. I've gained a hundred. <laughs> Just before I start, um, as I was preparing um, earlier this morning and going over things, I received a news flash um, on my cell phone concerning Israel and learning that Iran has launched probably a thousand drones to strike Israel and they're expecting a whole wave of cruise missiles behind them. And I'd just like to pause and you know, pray for the peace of Jerusalem because this could be the start of a major war. And um, I don't want to be around if that happens, really. So let us pray. Lord, we just take a moment to pause and to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And it's so complex 
what's going on in the Middle East with Israel and Gaza and Hamas and Hezbollah and the backers of Hezbollah being Iran and, and Israel taking preemptive strikes and Lord, we do not know what to pray except to obey what the scriptures say. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So we pray for the peace of Jerusalem and for wisdom. And Lord, as these, this major attack is happening right now, Lord, we pray that you will intervene. And in the, in the corridors of power, Lord, we pray that you will close doors to evil people and you'll open doors for peacemakers. And Lord, we know that all this is in the context of what you said. You are coming again. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today and um, next week, I'm going to be looking at the theme of the offence of the cross. We've looked at last week the resurrection and we teased out some of the things that it means. And, and I think it's, a good, um, it's good to go back and consider the cross and you've probably heard that term, the offence of the cross. And so that's what we're going to look at. Now the cross is the symbol of our Christian faith. And uh, it symbolises Christianity in a really brilliant way. It's brilliant branding. Having transformed a tool of torture and anguish and death into one of forgiveness and hope. And whether it is a cross with a crucifix, that is Jesus hanging on the cross, as the Roman Catholics and other, uh, the Orthodox Church has, or the empty cross that we Protestant churches make a big thing of, as it makes a statement about the resurrection of Jesus. Whatever it is, it is a very powerful symbol and pointer to the power it represents. Jesus the Messiah was crucified for the final, uh, as the final for all time sacrifice for the sins of the world. He took upon himself the full wrath of God for human sin. Another way of saying this is that Jesus took upon himself the full blast of God's terrible judgment that every person faces in their sin. We don't talk about that very much anymore. We talk about grace. But please be assured that grace and God's love is also very, very much part of what um, I'll be saying over the next two Sundays. As believers in Christ and his death and resurrection, when we stand before the judgment seat of our holy God, we're going to have an advocate who will be speaking at our side for us. And he will say something like, I've borne and suffered your judgment, O God, for this one. And they have put their faith in me and accepted that my death alone makes them righteous in your sight. And the voice from the judgment seat will reply, because, something like this, because of your faith in my son, there is no charge of sin brought against you. You are righteous and you are free. Welcome into my presence for eternity. And I think that's about the time that I will stop trembling. Now those who do not believe in Christ stand alone before the judgment seat and make their own plea concerning their sin. I was a good person, for example. But there is no defence before the judgment seat except Christ. Since the cross became a symbol as Christians, it and the faith it represents has been hated and despised. If you're a scholar of history, you'll know this. At the moment, there's a solid anti-Christian movement and sentiment emerging in Europe that echoes what has happened down the centuries. There comes a time when society turns against the symbol itself 
and what it represents. And it goes for the people who hold that symbol. This time round, there are suburbs in London and Birmingham and England that are predominantly Muslim areas where churches cannot advertise Easter and Christmas services on their signage because it is offensive to the locals. These are areas where Sharia law has been established. The sentiment is anti-Christian. Leading into Easter this year, a supermarket chain in England called Greenland stopped selling hot cross buns with the obvious tradition, uh, Christian tradition, traditional uh, connection and replaced them with hot tick buns because the idea of the cross might have offended customers. In terms of marketing, I think Nike were the winners, really. <laughs> there was a nationwide boycott of the tick buns, so they quickly restocked with hot cross buns. I thought that was funny. But concerning at the same time, in the build-up to the 2024 Olympics, in Paris, a big merchandise launch of Olympic paraphernalia, including the main thing poster, was held on March the 4th. Now, you won't be able to see very much detail, but it's actually brilliant when you look at it really close. Um, it's a caricature of Paris hosting the Olympics. It has this broad panorama, but some very detailed... Um, very closely detailed scenes. The poster caused many French people to react because the artist did not include the cross on top of Napoleon's uh, tomb. The cross was replaced just by a spike thing. The woke brigade says the cross is no longer relevant in French society and it might offend visiting athletes and visitors. Now, I thought that France was almost totally secular. You know, not many Christians, not many effective churches. But I'm, I'm really surprised at the upwelling of French feeling about the cross not being on that poster. Because the people, a large group of people, rose up and said that the cross is very much part of their heritage. It's also interesting that there is a resurgence in France of secular non-religious people wanting to explore that Christian heritage, even though it's such a secular, secular country. And the, the, the openness to searching their Christian roots is driven by a sense of unease, again over the Ismailization of parts of their country like Britain in the big cities, where in, France, in, in Paris there are suburbs that are Islamic and are governed by Sharia law. God always intended the cross to be an offence to the world and a symbol of hope for Christian believers. In Galatians, Paul is writing when a faction of Jewish Christians turned against him. And he makes this comment in Galatians 5, 11 and 12. Dear brothers and sisters, if I were still preaching that you must be circumcised, as some say I do, why am I still being persecuted? If I were no longer preaching the salvation of Christ, of the, uh, if I was no longer preaching salvation through the cross of Christ, no one would be offended. The Jewish Christian faction were insisting that new Gentile converts, that's the blokes, um, must be circumcised before baptism. They were adding a requirement to salvation. And Paul refused to go down this path and insisted he would only preach salvation through the cross of Christ. Acknowledging this caused offence. The message of the cross is scandalous 
the gr- scandalous. The Greek word for offence is scandalon. So let's look at the scandalon of the cross. Now you will identify a number of these offences in your own thinking. And a number of you will be snared by them and I suspect unable to progress to the freedom of Christ because you may be offended or you are offended by the cross even though you've been part of the church for years and years. So this is hard territory. Let's start, first of all, The cross of Christ represents barbarity and cruelty. I've had to work through this one myself. How can a loving God not only allow but orchestrate the crucifixion of Jesus? I'm of two minds in preparing a Good Friday service and thinking about properly conveying the meaning and the power of the crucifixion. When I was in the Waipu Parish where I began my ministry, Mel Gibson's film The Passion of the Christ was released. It is a graphic representation of a crucifixion with very little left to the imagination. Although those in the know about such things say it could have been much more graphic and realistic, for example with the flogging scene. I shudder the thought. Anyway, I was much younger. I showed scenes from the movie in a Good Friday service in Waipu. And it sure offended. It was scandalous. People yelled out in shock as they saw the graphic scenes. There was sobbing as people broke emotionally and maybe the message did his home in some way but then there was this handful of people who stormed out of the church in shock and disgust and later told me about it part of the offence of the cross is that God has something to do with such torture and cruelty to the Gentiles of Paul's time the image of a crucified man was a symbol of shame, of weakness and disgrace. The Greek mind esteemed learning, virtue, aesthetics, that that means looking handsome, and strength in attaining wisdom. Of discerning the logos of the divine, represented in part by the unknown God, being the divine mind of reason, and being the unmoved mover, in the universe and so that's a philosophical approach that gave order and purpose to their world the very thought that the creator would require the torture of an innocent man to atone for the sins of others was regarded as immoral indecent and utterly preposterous now the eating the leading atheists of our age in the new atheist movement like Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens and Daniel Dennett use the same argument in our time quite forcibly. How can you believe in a God that did that? That's absolutely scandalous. Now as a side note, just going out in the cul de sac a little bit, Richard Dawkins, who's Um, a lot of you may know, he wrote the influential book The God Delusion, gave an interview last week and he said he recognised the benefits of Christian culture and enjoyed, to quote, living in a culturally Christian country. So he's in England. And at the same time he said he did not believe a word of the Christian faith. And he said this following his critique of Islam as being a dangerous threat to the British way of life with its open democracy where people have the freedom of speech and thought as opposed to what happens when Sharia law begins to take hold. So there we go, this atheist, very famous atheist of our time 
identified himself as a cultural Christian. Meaning the cross is part of that cultural understanding, although it is still not fully considered by the progressive intellectual elite like Dawkins. But you never know, one day. The cross offended the Jewish mind, and it still does. And the scandal on begins in Deuteronomy 21 from verse 22. If someone has committed a crime worthy of death and is executed and hung on a tree, the body must not remain hanging from the tree overnight. You must bury the body that same day for anyone who is hung is cursed in the sight of God. In this way you will prevent the defilement of the land the Lord your God is giving you as your special possession. To the Jews, the idea that Jesus had to die a death cursed by the law of Moses is regarded as entirely repugnant to the fundamental beliefs of the Christian of sorry of the Jewish faith. How could the Messiah, the anointed one of God, ever be cursed? That's what they ask. Even though the Old Testament prophesied that the Messiah would be a suffering servant. For example, in Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, Zechariah 12. And he would be a suffering servant because of Israel's sins. Paul's teaching of the person of the Messiah does not help the situation. So in 2 Corinthians 5.21, and I, this is from the New International Version, because the wording's a bit better for my purposes. Um, he wrote, God made him, that's Christ, who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And then in Galatians 3, from verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Now Paul writes about the offence, about the scandal, and the foolishness of the gospel message. So he writes this fairly well on, in his, well, yeah, about two thirds of the way through his ministry. And it follows the time for, you know, it's the time after um, the, the faction of Jewish Christians turn against him. It comes just at the time when the synagogues are banning him and banning Christians from participating in them. And he writes this, 1 Corinthians 1 from verse 23. So where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars, and the world's brilliant debaters? God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish, since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom. He has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. It is foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven. And it is foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended, scandalous, and the Jews say it's all nonsense. And can I add that people, both in the church and outside of it, can also find the cross very scandalous especially those in the church who believe that the way to please, to please God is by simply, and it's not so simple, but simply leading a moral life with good works, the cross becomes offensive. This leads us to another point. The cross reveals the raw truth about our spiritual condition. God's way of salvation is an affront, a scandal, an insult, and ultimately it is the verdict about the insufficiency of our human effort to stand in a righteous relationship before our God who is holy. 
human works or merits are useless before God and the church has lost the gospel when it creates a climate where people are shifted to good works as the way of salvation, even taking the book of James into consideration. The truth about the human condition through the cross is offensive because it's not flattering to say that we're twisted and broken and helpless as a human race. The world craves the image of beauty, strength, capability, power and wisdom. The world wants us to worship an idolised humanity. A humanity that is the master of its own destiny. Whereas God wants us to confess, as in Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. The gospel message implies that our sinful condition is so profound that it took the death of Jesus to satisfy God's anger at our sin. And that's offensive to so many people saying that. The death of the Son of God on the cross tells us that we cannot save ourselves and are hopelessly lost in sin. It's an affront to our human pride that is so much part of our, our makeup. The cross tells us that humanity is sinful and under the sentence of divine wrath or wrath. I should say wrath. Rolls off the tongue better. But for me, wrath is a time, you know, it's God's anger and it's terrible to contemplate. It'll be terrible to confront. It's a, the cross is a scandal because it represents the condemnation or judgment of humankind by our God who is holy. And so contrary to the work ideologies of seculars, New Age thinkers, progressive liberals, human nature is not inherently good. The cross declares that all of humankind's pious religious activity and moral attempts are incapable of pleasing God and that we by ourselves cannot attain genuine revelation about this ultimate reality and truth, that the wages of sin is death. Then, after judgment, there is the second death. I'm going to have to preach a whole sermon on the second death, but here's just an appetizer. There's much debate about what the second death is. Coming out of the medieval period with, a, with its artistic representation of eternal hell with burning fire and sulfur and heaps of smoke, and there you have the, the writhing bodies of those who have been damned for eternity. It portrays a very terrible scenario. And the underpinning, the underpinning theology of this view is that the soul is inherently immortal, it's created indestructible, and will exist and not even God can destroy the soul. And as I said last week when we talked about the bodily resurrection of Christ and of ourselves. Be careful of using the word immortality because it actually comes from Greek philosophy. It's a human idea that our soul is indestructible. Nothing, so we just live this life, live another life, whatever the, the, the scenario can But it's actually the whole idea of immor uh, I can't say immorality, but immortality, um, 
came back into the church through the Roman Catholic theologian Thomas Aquinas, who rediscovered Greek philo philosophy in the 1200s, and he introduced it into the theological thinking of the Roman Catholic Church. And we picked up a lot of that in the Protestant Church as well. So the only time we can talk about immort being immortal is after resurrection. That's when we become immortal. The other view is that the second death is the annihilation of a person, resurrected body, mind and soul. And by annihilation I mean gone, cease to exist. Jesus taught in Matthew 10, 28, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. Fear only God, who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, in my own thinking, I'm still coming to a decision, and I don't really need to make it before I die, but, but I kind of do hope it's the case that when it comes to the meaning of hell, the second death is annihilation. But, and it's a big but, there are enough scriptures indicating eternal torment and suffering and total isolation from God. And that awaits those who are judged for their sin. And it's something that's worth thinking about in the middle of the night. The cross proclaiming God's judgment on humanity is offensive to humanity, to our self-autonomy, the idea that a loving God can condemn people to hell. Unthinkable, that is not, as the atheists argue, what a God of love would do. The message of the cross is offensive because it requires the death of our ego. The ego is part of our pride that elevates our self-perception that we can stand on a level playing field, if you like, with God who is holy. And there we can demand our rights. I demand to live my life as I want it. I demand to be able to unsin sin so I can live my life the way I choose. When I was in Wellington in February, I met with one of the leaders of our church as I began preparing for my role as being the national moderator of the Presbyterian Church. And I can tell you there's quite a bit to get your head around. And it's kind of daunting knowing what the role involves. But anyway, we talked at length about the blessings and challenges facing our denomination. At one point, we discussed the need for more people to put themselves forward for ministry training because there ain't many of us ministers left for the number of parishes. And a lot of us are retiring. I think a third of us are retiring in the next five years. So we talked about that, and my friend made an interesting comment. He said, well, there's still a lot of people who do apply to uh, or for ministry training, but most of them are turned down because of the demands they make. The most common demand that is made is that we want to stay where we are during our training, and when we are ordained, we want to stay where we are. And for me, that's a small example, actually, yeah, a small example of ego or the flesh at work. When Jesus calls you to ministry or, or ministry, any ministry, your ego must die. And Bonhoeffer wrote in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, when Christ calls a person, he bids they come and die. You can't make demands because Jesus has become your Lord. He becomes, you become the follower. 
The ego with its demands is the old nature, to use older language. If we only understood that our old nature is crucified with Christ and our old identity dies with it. So using the ministry training example, I immediately knew the cost when I heard that loud thought and I heard that call to become a Presbyterian minister. At the time, literally, I was cleaning my flash utility vehicle that had metallic paint, very shiny, and had real flecks of gold in it. Had chrome mags. And the cabin was lined with buttoned velvet material. It was beautiful. <laughs> and having just completed working for different firms constructing a third pot line at the aluminium smelter and being paid at least twice as much as carpenters working in town, I was well inducted into the way of ego and demands. But I knew when that call came, I had to give that up. And then when it came to our first call to ministry, to Waipu, which is about 2,000 kilometres from here, after we requested to be considered for a parish down south to be near our, our, our ageing parents, guess what? They sent us 2,000 kilometres north. The lovely church did, I mean. So we left our southland community and our families and went in obedience to God's call. And it required for both Helen and I that death of ego and demands, and it did come at a cost. But dying to ego and demands enters you into your new identity. And with it comes God's blessing. And there are no regrets. This week I watched a Syrian Orthodox bishop on YouTube preaching a sermon. Very interesting chat. He proposed that two agents are are at work in the life of every genuine believer. The Holy Spirit and Satan. Something that God allows. I've never thought of things as bluntly as that, but I think he's got a point. And I've noticed that in subtle ways, Satan seems to be able to advise the church to use the world's methods for the promotion of the gospel. His advice is to promote to prominence those who rely on the flesh, the ego and demands to do God's work. The world's standard for success, however, is always contrary to what the Spirit of Christ will lead us to. There are troubling examples of this, and I just pick one, in the area of morals and ethics. Biblical sins are unsinned because they will make the church more attractive to non-Christians. Heard that argument? Let's stop making the church offensive to people. Let's love, accept and make room for them as they are, without repentance. That is the unconditional grace and love of God, the woke liberals tell us. Remember the offence of the cross for sinners. Sin brings judgment and death, even the second death. The sin that is supported by ego and demands dies on the cross. You cannot follow Jesus without the death of ego and demands. Paul reflects on this, Galatians 2, 20. 
My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I cannot treat the grace of God, of God as meaningless. This means that the advice to accept people's egos and demands happily controlled by sin and apply grace to accommodate them without repentance is not actually God's grace and love. We're called to take up our cross. Now what does that mean? In context... It means we die to ego and demands. And also, we die to the ego and demands of those who find the way of the cross offensive. Next week, I want to carry on with this thing. And I've set the tentative reading. Well, it's not, this is the one I'm going to use. And, um, I kind of have the idea I might call my sermon the gospel of surrender. But this is one of your favourite passages. Okay? Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's law. Good passage, eh? This is very much about the offence of the cross, the scandal. Now, for many years, as a Presbyterian, I thought, cool, it's got nothing to do with me. That's to do with the Pentecostals. But it's got to do with all of us. So I invite you to come and get part two next week as we really knuckle down into the offence of the cross and actually it's not only about knowing Jesus in a spiritual sense, in a personal sense, but the big question underlying that one, that verse, that passage, is does Jesus know you? Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the cross, our symbol, which we honour and probably loved until this morning. Lord, it does cause offence. And even in our own personal walk over many years, there are still areas of the cross that we find difficult. Lord, help us to understand the message of the cross, of the gospel, and to be able to cope with the scandal, not only in our own spiritual walk, but also in our interactions with the world. Holy Spirit be with us, we pray, as we search the scriptures for truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Peter. As I was preparing last night for um, the worship service today, um, the word assurance came to me. I thought that because of a couple of incidents that I'd heard about um, this week that kind of really broke my heart. And earlier in the week, Zona had been in the office with me and I was saying, oh, what's a good finishing song? And Zona said, why don't you go with Blessed Assurance? So after the message that we've just heard, I think it's very appropriate. Let's stand and sing Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine.
my, my, my apologies. That was a good segue, but it didn't work. Anyway, because he lives, same thing, really. Right song, wrong song, but right thought. It's all about assurance <laughs> as we go from here today. Through faith, God wants you to fall back into his arms of love. He wants you to lean upon him and all your heart and all with all your heart and all your trust. He will not fail you forsake you, or let you down. He is your heavenly Father, and he is your God, and God loves you. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you back next week. Um, go and enjoy a cup of tea. Mm.